Welcome to Café Rollist, my little excuse to finally interact with people who are not in London and in Europe. And, and today I've got a truly amazing guest. I was uh, perusing through Harlem and Bond yesterday and uh, I thought it was, uh, it was amazing. Uh, Chris, thank you so much for joining and uh, could you introduce yourself for people who would not be familiar with your work already? Uh, sure. Thank you for having me on. My name is Chris Spivey. I'm the president founder, basically Dark Reed Studios. We're a small independent company that's aimed at increasing, creating, improving diversity in gaming and facilitating more of community. The first book that we published was called Harlem Unbound. It's about mythos horror set in 1920s Harlem and it directly addresses racism and Lovecraft. The second edition is actually about to come out from Chaosium any day now. Well, technically, it's... as of yesterday. Sorry, uh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I think it was already out in PDF. You, when you say it's coming out, you mean the, the physical copies. Uh, yeah, because everyone loves PDFs, but they don't have that sort of tactile sensation, and I've gotten a slew of PMs. When is the physical book coming out? I don't want the PDF. I want the physical book. <laughs> and so I spent a, a lot of time telling people, if you buy the PDF from Chaosium, they'll give you a voucher for that will discount your physical book, so you can have both. You can read it now and tell me what you think. Wow, I did not realize that. So I bought a copy. I was like, wow, that's a bit pricey for a PDF, but uh, fair enough. I'm willing to pay for that. But uh, yeah, I was like a complete fool uh, not realizing that I got myself a voucher for a physical copy. That's I've great. done so much marketing for Chaosium, I'm waiting for my kickback. <laughs> so, and you were just telling me that you actually need to add something to your introduction, to your resume, your growing resume. Uh, so as of yesterday, I am now the vice president of the Game Manufacturers Association. Congratulations! Uh, on, thank you. It's it's a it's a huge honor. I'm super excited, but I'm also seeing the enormous amount of work that we have to do. So I'm I'm getting ready for it. Yeah, I, I got this immense respect for any organization organizing large events. I'm not I'm not aware of all the work that Gamma does beyond organizing a, a convention but uh, yeah uh, expo dragon meet here just having organized very tiny tiny minuscule little event and seeing the hurdle you encounter and the, the challenge it is to to engage with the community which is passionate but uh, that's that's sometimes difficult uh yeah uh congratulations and uh yeah good luck for for all the hard work which is uh awaiting you there. I think it's a fantastic news. I'm super looking forward to the first board meeting that's tomorrow. It's like, hey, we elected you. Now get to work. Wow. Wow. <laughs> well, yeah, again, best of luck. Well, um, so my first ice-breaking question, the, the tradition of Café Holist is, uh, what is your routine like at the moment, if you have any? So as a working full-time with an, a normal day job with a full family and doing darker hue, every day is different. It depends on when, when my six-year-old wakes up. Some days she'll be super cool and she'll sleep till nine, which means I get like three or four hours of writing in the morning. Then I can do some stuff with her and then I do the day job. Or like this morning, she'll wake up at five and then it's go, 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 go. And have you picked up any new skill or routine recently or uh, skill or hobby or interest recently uh, so i used to be in the army and i used to sleep out a lot in tents and we'd have to put them up and once i got out of the army i was like i'm never sleeping in a tent again and then the, the six-year-old discovered this thing called camping and sleeping bags so we got our sleeping bag and then this weekend we spent the entire time putting up a brand new tent which te technology has changed since I was in the army till now. So that was a, a fun morning of the two of us putting it together. And so it's been a lot of camping and reboning up on my kids. So are, are you going out in the wild or just uh, in your back oh, no. garden? <laughs> uh, backyard camping. The best, you got everything you need, all the <laughs> amenities, uh, all the toys. Uh, I need to send you uh, my son watches a uh, show, animated show called Hey Dougie. And there's one episode when uh, they try to go camping. It doesn't go uh, very well, but 
it, it's very cute. It's all about, oh, where, where's my plushie now? And uh, the <laughs> guineas go out, fetch a plushie. Oh, yeah, but I want a glass of water now. And uh, yeah, they're just very lucky. They do it, it in the backyard at the end of, of the episode. So yeah, I like that. Lemon Bond, uh, where's to start? So that's your first published work? Or what had, did you worked on before that? So that is the first book that my company published. I myself uh, have been published by some other companies. So it depends on which one you'd like to talk about first. They're sort of the same, but definitely different. I mean, was any of them which was more of a stepping stone to our lemon bond in, in any way? I would say everything. Because when I first showed up in the industry, maybe in 2013, 2014, I was pushing the idea for Holloman Bound even then, but I was someone that no one had ever heard of with an idea no one really wanted to print. And I received a lot of, that is an interesting idea, but it won't sell books. No one wants to see it. So, and then I got an opportunity to go to Metatopia. And at Metatopia, I met a lot of great people. And I owe a lot to Avi. I forgot her last name now. So I was ill prepared. Sorry. But when I was at Metatopia, it gave me a chance to talk to some other designers and make a few contacts. And that's where I met Neil Raymond Price, who put me in touch with Onyx Path. And Onyx Path was one of the first people to give me actual work to do. I also had a chance at one year at Gen Con to meet Robin Laws and tell Robin Laws I have this great idea. And Robin said, sure, here's a, a Skype number. Talk to me when we're not at Gen Con. And he introduced me to Kat and Simon, and that's how I sort of landed my first Pilgrim Press assignment, which is a scenario for Out of the Woods. And then that led into Cthulhu Confidential, which is sort of almost like the stepping ground for what Harlan Bound is, because it gave me a chance to write about 1940s DC with a black veteran and dealing, touching on the topics I really wanted to dive more into. And I think one of the reasons they approached me about doing Langston was because I'd already sort of pitched them Harlem Unbound also. And so that sort of gave them an idea of where I was going when they wanted to diversify the book itself. So yeah, what I, I found out just looking up a few things before uh, today is that Arlem and Bound, that's the second edition being published by Chaosium right now, but your first edition was uh, multi-system or system agnostic in the sense that you, you had stats even for both Gumshoe system and uh, the Chaosium system, is that right? Uh, I did, because growing up in Alabama, for me, I never had a lot of money, but I was always interested in gaming. So one of the things I really wanted to do was to make the book approachable for people that couldn't afford to buy additional supplement books. And since Gumshoe was OGL and I already had worked with Pelgrim Press, I went to them and said, hey, I'd like to include like a dual stat version for the book. Would you mind allowing me to also use your logo on the book, which helps sort of solidify in other people's minds that this is something that Gum that the owners of Pelgrim would like for you to use also. And so that's why it is a complete core book for Gumshoe, but it's a source book for Call of Duty. And uh, so you, you had the idea for Harlem and Bond a, a long time ago. I, I, I'm, I'm not aware uh, where you were from yourself. Was Harlem 1920s uh, the, the setting you always had in mind or did you have several other historical settings you were considering to, to discuss those su the subjects of racism and, and the fantastic uh, at the same time? What, what, or early was it, okay, it's Harlem Renaissance because it needs to be that, that topic rather than the Wild West, for instance, with your more recent project? So, unfortunately, in America, I could choose any point in time in our history and somewhat globally, and I could talk about racism. That goes without saying. But I just didn't want to talk about racism. I wanted to talk about Black excellence and an idea where creativity, ingenuity, and drive itself was changing the world. And the Harlem Renaissance was an excellent point for that. And it dovetailed beautifully with the fact that it's set in the twenties, which is a classical mythos period. And I also have a personal connection to the Renaissance. So I've always kind of grew up with it. And all of those things together just made it impossible not to put out the book. And I was stunned that no one had done that beforehand. I mean, it, Harlem, it's, it's a brand in itself. It's something even even when you're white like me, you've heard of Harlem uh, in popular culture. It, it made it found its way. 
uh, after just perusing again in your book, uh, I didn't delve it uh, very deep yet. I mean, there's already there's so much stories wait, wait, there. Wait, you haven't read my book yet? Not completely, no. Oh, I'm, I'm off the call. <laughs> oh no, please don't do that because if everyone <laughs> in that situation would do that, I would have absolutely zero guests. I was telling that last Friday. I know nothing of my guests most of the time, so actually you're lucky that I've read a bit your book and purchased <laughs> it because. Most of the people I get, I don't get their books. You, you think I got Spire by Grant Talbot? No, we talk about it all the time. <laughs> I, I haven't touched the damn thing. But, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, there's so many rich stories and colorful characters uh, in Harlem Renaissance uh, that, I mean, it's crazy that you don't see more more movies about that time and that place. You, you hear more about uh, Luke Cage than you do about the actual historical figures and talented artists who, who live there then well I, I will point out that luke cage actually peppered through a lot of historical and great facts into the show which i will say the first season and the first six episodes of luke cage excellent the back half they sort of lost whatever they were doing for the first season but that's that's a totally different comic talk that we could have that i could get on a soapbox for like six hours easy uh, where was I going with that? I'm 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 giving the worst. I'm going with the. I, giving... I have an innate ability to have people lose their train of thought. No, yeah, <laughs> uh, at the moment it's terrible uh, for some reason. I, I think it's I'm starting to be drained on being locked down uh, because yeah, uh, no, I'm, my my capacity to have uh, conversations is g getting worse uh, uh, with each day. Ah, so <laughs> yeah. Right, so how about I throw you a lifeline. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> So I am related to Zora Neale Hurston. She is my cousin, which gave me sort of, I've always kind of lived with the Renaissance in one sense or another, which uh, if you don't know, she's a famous writer, activist, um, anthropologist, historian, and some people would say, what's the right word for it? Cultist, because she also did a lot of different study and studies into the occult, other things too. And she'd be one of the best uh pulp adventures there is yeah that sounds that sounds amazing <laughs> i mean there's so and many for... yeah go ahead yeah. i mean jumping to your other project uh hunted west not too long ago uh, i was hearing about for the very first time about bass reeves uh another... <laughs> and i mean why isn't there not only one movie but like a, a complete series of movies dedicated to to Bass Reeves uh, for people. Well, uh, well, yeah, there there is technically if you if you don't mind the whitewashing and seeing him as a Lone Ranger. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. Uh, <laughs> that's that that's a big thing. That uh, so uh, can you tell us uh, who's Bass Reeves? Uh, because I I dropped the name, um, but most people would know uh, who that was. Before we do that, though, uh, I think that Chaosium would be very upset. Oh, if I didn't. <laughs> show you the cover of the book that I now have in my hands as my writer's copy. So I, I feel obligated to them to do that. Is that a collector um, edition or is it, is it going to be the, because it's different from uh, what I've this, seen on the PDF. This is the leatherette edition and this is the the normal edition. But I can use my voucher on any of those two. Yes. And the, the normal edition is incredible cover work by Britton Reese which everyone should see. And I have to be this one to show them the original first edition cover that was also by Bernal. The... Right, my, my pitching I was done. I feel like I've done my bit. <laughs> we can come back to Harlem and Bond. It's just I was running out of, of questions. And uh, yeah. So Bass Reese, uh, the, the figure who might probably has inspired the old superhero genre because his story that's that's the story of uh of harrow or the green arrow and batman but uh, all put into a historical figure yet nobody until recently i think watchmen helped a bit the tv show to bring a, a bit of the spotlight on that character but he's people... popped up in other places and he's referenced but watchmen did the the best job of actually sort of putting at least an image out there in a very popular way that everyone could access. 
because a lot of people will sort of rumor and they like whisper that well there's also bass reeves but they'll whisper it very quietly and then they'll mention someone else right after that like bat masterson and then they'll want to talk about bat masterson and dovetail the conversation away but bass reeves is almost a, a superhero in of himself was enslaved managed to escape and went into what is now considered the Oklahoma Territory that was at the time different First Nations tribes and he sort of integrated with them, learned the language and the customs and got married, started being a farmer and then was recruited by the Hanging Judge to become a U.S. Deputy Marshal and he was the pinnacle of what a Marshal should be. He didn't kill people if he didn't have to, he used disguises to capture and trick people and he adhered to the law so much. There was even a point in time where he had to arrest his own son. It, it's just, it's really, well, yes, wild to picture that that time and age, and uh, picture this this man have these adventures, and you know, put on, uh, yeah, disguise to trick people. Uh, I mean, the job of a U.S. marshal is something very peculiar, but now it's uh, it's an organization. You got the, the technical means. Uh, we're talking. We're talking about the Mandalorian type of stuff. <laughs> it's you're you're you are well, a lawful bounty hunter in a completely wild, well, not completely, but a, a wild territory at the fringe between the Native Americans and uh, and the expanding West, which which was very dangerous in itself. Well, we all know that Boba Fett was based off of the Man with No Name from the. Um... Spaghetti trilogy with Clint Eastwood. That's literally who Boba Fett is. So, it just kind of makes sense. Yeah, they were talking at some point. I think now it's it's replaced by the Mandalorian, but they wanted to do uh, an actual sort of spaghetti movie with with Boba Fett, and even now they 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 got plans of making a Boba Fett series, but a movie w with someone would pick his armor. It would not be him, but. Uh, yeah, going back it's to the, the spaghetti it. roots uh, uh, of it. Um, so uh, I'm a big uh, proponent of playing role-playing games in a historical setting. And uh, at the same time, th there's a lot of pushback with that uh, because people... Th usually what I hear is, oh, if you do that, then you end up giving explanations for stuff which happened. Uh, by and you giving excuse from people, bad people in the past for being bad by saying they were supernatural. If, no matter, even if you you careful with that, uh, people are concerned that if you play in a historical setting, nothing can happen because it's set and where's your agency? You cannot change the big events. So what's the point? And the third one is. Um, yeah, but I want to play a LGBTQ uh, character. I want to play a character of a minority, uh, and I cannot play those characters in history because uh, to people it feels like they did not exist, which uh, I disagree to. And I thought it was amazing reading your book yesterday that all the questions I had about that you answered very <laughs> clearly. <laughs> That and much more regarding racism and okay, so I want to run Harlem. I'm gonna play a, a black character. What does that mean? Can I do that uh, as white? Uh, what can I do? What can I do? What should I take into consideration? It's amazing the number of questions you answered from the get go in your book. Thank you. Um, there's really a lot I can say to that because that was all one big long compliment. Uh, so I, as I've always said, history is full of examples that prove any naysayers wrong. The problem is all, a lot of those examples have either been whitewashed, destroyed, or purposely removed from history. So it's harder to find them, but they exist. And you should never let anyone tell you you can't be this in a historical setting. And the thing is, any game that you play in, once your characters interact with it, it is no longer going to be that set narrative that you have in mind. Be it your own fantasy world you made, be it actual history or this amazing, gripping sci-fi tale. Once the players enter it, they are the world. Their actions should influence and change everything around them. But the thing that a lot of narrators don't always do is there are repercussions for their actions. Like all of my players now know that if I want, I can walk in, walk into wherever Hearst is, and I can shoot Hearst dead. And that is great. You've done it. 
Now, anyone that was a friend or ally of Hearst or has business dealing with him that you've damaged, and if they know who you are, will likely put a bounty on your head now to go hunt you down for the pain that you caused them. So it's not that you can't do it, but there are repercussions for your actions. So you have to think them through, and the world progresses like it would from that point on. Now, do you think also that uh, there's sort of a social contract needed between the player and the game master that uh, what I found uh, when playing in historical settings, you often have that player or those couple of players who what they want they, they want to break the machine rather than 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 play along like they they you tell them you're in a historical setting and the first thing they say okay hmm I'm gonna go there and kill that important individual from history without any sort of logic in terms of their their own character so I think there's sort of an agreement to say well you know you you still need to play characters within that time with their own motivation which is not I know what's going to happen in the future and I want to change it. Well, that goes for any game that you're playing at all. Like I could have my own, I have my own sci-fi game that I have. And if someone wanted to go, aha, my character that does this job still wants to kill this person. I have no reason to want to kill that person. It's the player making a choice, not the character. And that still breaks that contract. It's just not set historical games. So if you don't already have that with your players established, that's going to happen no matter what your game is. And yep. it's a matter of what you want to do. If it's a group of friends and you know that X always does this in every single game that you play, then the narrator may already be used to it and just run with it. It's like, all right, you go in, you shoot X, and then they just throw their entire scenario away and they run like a four or six hour block off the cuff, which is one of my favorite things to do. I mean, it applies even with fiction uh, in established setting. I go there and I want to attack Darth Vader. And you're like, okay, <laughs> If you, you want to have a go at that, <laughs> that one's <laughs> going to be that interesting. Never works out well. <laughs> but uh, I, I am a staunch uh, opponent of plot armor. I don't think any NPC should have it. Like the players, there should have the active force in the world. Their actions move everything else. Because without them, you're just writing. You're writing a story by yourself at home. Yeah, but at, at the same time. I don't know. It's it's just yes, but I find some. I think I lost you. Yep. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? I can. I can hear you. No problem. Oh. It was not cut off. My microphone is working. Can you hear me? Hello. I can't hear you. Oh, what's going on? Let me try something. How about now? No. Oh. Oh. We lost Chris. Hopefully, we'll be back in a second. So, I'm filling up this as Chris is disconnected. Hopefully, he'll be back with us in a second. Sorry for. People were on top of not having the... Oh, there he is. Are you with us? Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. I'm very unlucky with my internet at the moment. Oh! Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, I could hear you all the time, but you could not hear me, apparently. Can you hear me? I can. I am yeah. just re-logging in. That's fine. Okay, we we're back. Uh, so, yeah, uh, yeah, what, what I was saying is... Uh, yeah, at the same time, you know, the the amount of power, specific characters played by characters at a set time, at least at the beginning of a campaign, uh, is limited. They they don't have they they have the agen as much agency as the characters have. They don't have the means. Like for the example of I'm gonna go I'm gonna go after Darth Vader. It's like yeah, you're playing a, a smuggler level one in Star Wars D6, so 
So yeah, you, you got depth on your starship and you need to take your starship to a place. You need to find where Darth Vader is. You, there's still a lot of hurdles in game. <laughs> Which prevents you to but completely. See, that becomes their whole campaign, though. Yeah. Like yeah. even even like the level one smuggler with his four buddies, they decide we want to kill Darth Vader, and so then you scale each individual scenario out for them. Like it's the four of them. We want to kill Darth Vader. We don't have a ship, so like the first three to four sessions may be that small group finding a contact, getting the equipment they need to then steal a ship to get off world, and so you scale down their thing. So, but they're still the center of the world. And their movements are in fact impacting everything around them. And when they get off world, that increases their scope and moves them closer towards their goal. Because killing Darth Vader isn't a single session scenario. That's that's like a, an epic campaign. Yeah, that that becomes the campaign. That's the thing. You you take an objective. Either the game master offers an objective which is co-opted by the players, or the players come with their big objective, which is they we, they're going to be the one to blow the Death Star, uh, and so on. And, and that was happen, happening there. Uh, jumping between uh, things, uh, we got Sardonicus who is a regular of the chat room and he he, he wants to uh, ask uh, where did the idea for Hunted West came from? Uh, so growing up as a kid, at first I never liked westerns because I lived with my grandmother who would take over the television when I wanted to watch cartoons to watch westerns. Because in Alabama I think westerns started around 9, cartoons started around 7. So there was a two-hour window as a kid before we watched Western. <laughs> but it eventually became sort of a bonding thing for the two of us, and it's how I got close to my, my grandmother, is that we watched watch Westerns together. And even as I was watching them, it always occurred to me that there was no one that looks like me. And if there is, they're always the butt of the joke, or they're, like, carrying something for someone else before they step off screen to be replaced by a white protagonist. And that always stuck with me and bothered me. And one of the things I wanted to do was I wanted to actually go and tell the story of all those other voices that shaped the West and the United States, be they the First Nations people or African-Americans, Jewish, everyone, LGBTQ, that helped drive our country to what it is, whose stories have completely been erased. And I wanted those stories to come to the forefront, which is what Haunted West is. And I've always kind of had a love for the Weird West just because it's more horror-esque and it gives me some extra playing space. And I sort of merge those two together. And making Harlem Unbound is, was a great starting point because this project's larger, more complicated, more groups of people. It's also why I have a larger team of writers from different backgrounds that have other voices because I can't speak for other people. I can bring their stories up but I want to make sure if there are other people that want to speak and try to do it, they have the opportunity and platform to do it with. The Hunted West is a, I mean, it's it's a case study of that whitewashing, I find, and the reaction that I saw from people saying, oh, well, but it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's revisionism because there were not people of colors and it's, it's crazy how we've been brainwashed by the John Waynes and all those movies uh, representing the white man all the time and again no LGBTQ and no people of color and to the point when we people think that's reality and they, they get confused between what history was and, and you can find documents of that and what's been the story told and now they're so attached to that that myth that they they're not accepting to revise this myth to make it even even more accurate. And even for like some of the writers in the book didn't understand that cow, uh, about of the cow folks about thirty percent of them were African American. They didn't know that. And one of the other things I had to really combat is that some of the white writers on the book wanted to play down some of the actual atrocities of history and to make it nicer. And that's not what we're doing because that's not telling the actual truth or someone's story. And what we want to do is we want to provide context for it. We're not saying like X or Y is right or wrong. We're saying this is what happened and these are some of the facts around it. And we may extrapolate from there, but we're equipping you, the reader, with what you need to be able to make a decision and hopefully spark enough interest that you'll go and read about it and research it and find it and then play the game so other people can see it, get exposed to it, do their own research, and then keep carrying that on and on throughout. 
I'm jumping between uh, Arlem and Bond and uh, uh, <laughs> uh, Haunted West, uh, but I was wondering about do, those all those good advice you have in uh, Arlem and Bond. Uh, did did how much of that came out of play testing and engaging with the community with the first drafts of your game? Because again, I was very impressed by all thorough all the question were uh, and all the answer were regarding what you can you cannot play and uh, how you you actually do it effectively uh it started by being a black gamer and the many things that i encountered and i experienced i tried to distill out what would be useful and i started with that as my baseline and then i built it from there so Harlem and Bond, Hunted West. Uh, do you already have other his historical or alternative historical settings in mind uh, for future games? Uh, so my, my next project, you know, whenever I get a chance to do it, I'm actually going to space. It's my sort of Afro-Judeo futurism game that I was going to do with Chaosium, but we sort of parted ways about it, and now it's completely a darker new project. So I've done a lot of history. I want to tell a, a sci-fi story. Oh, wow, well, that's cool. So what's what's your twist beyond that? Uh, how far in the future are, are we? Uh, are we talking uh, Star Trek or The Expanse or even something in transhumanist and have much, much beyond uh, history? Um, uh, I'm not giving a lot away since it's... <laughs> I have to finish completely Haunted West before I do it. But other than it's going to deal with transhumanism and the evolution of humanity cool love that is it more i mean then i ask asking questions because you <laughs> you don't want to reveal too much but with science fiction i feel like i have to ask the question is it more utopian or dystopian <laughs> uh, i will let you guess okay <laughs> i have no clue <laughs> no clue whatsoever because it's You know, uh, that's one of the thing. I'm not sure to what extent uh, it's utopian versus dystopian things are, are, are a good or a bad thing. Uh, I've seen a lot of arguments regarding Star Trek. Uh, I'm a bit of a late adopting Trekker, but or Trekkie. I don't know which one is correct. Uh, and I, I like the utopian bit as something you, you would aim towards and something which would need to be updated because Uh, what you would consider utopian in the uh, late six, six, 60s might not be the same as the late 90s and doing it today uh, it was quite different and and now I find I, I regret a bit that not only with Star Trek but some superheroes as well you've got this aspect of I don't know if it's postmodernist or, or what but that utopian and positive ideas are are kind of childish and they're, they're not appropriate to to lay out because to uh, to be realistic you need to be dark and, and gritty uh, rather than uh, than give someone or something for people to aim towards too well utopian ideas are a nice goal to aim for but it's a it's if you're telling the story of reaching those goals or if you're telling the story that happens after you've achieved them So it's really which side of the coin that you want to be on. And a lot of people don't want to tell the story that deals with having to work your way to that utopia because you have to face a lot of hard truths that we currently live in. And it's easier for people that don't have to constantly engage with them on a second by second basis to go, I don't want to talk about that story. I want to talk about this story where everything's happy and shiny and everyone's already got what they need to do. And those aren't the stories I tell. Cool. So, uh, Hunted West, Arlem and Bond, the, the thing I, I often ask uh, my guests when they, they release a product like, like that is, uh, is it a standalone product or do you have plans for, for more adventures, for, for campaigns and supplements and, you know, a whole range of books like uh, all your vampire clans and uh, <laughs> Legend of the Five Rings clans, but uh, for Hunted West, a supplement for for the Jewish uh, in the Andy Wild West, a supplement for Native Americans and so on. So I've never had one idea that I don't have a slew of supplemental ideas for. For Holman Bound, though, I'm currently in a contract with Chaosium, so anything that comes out for Holman Bound while that contract is in place 
is something we'll both have to agree on. I do have a campaign book that I've been noodling around with for about a year now uh, that happens that sort of is a complete narrative story for a campaign that the players get to engage with. Something along the lines that would probably be six or seven different scenarios. And for Haunted West, it's, I've got a slew of ideas for different campaign books and some other source books for it. Because it's the Old West, and that's mythic. That's, led, that's story making in and of itself. That's like an endless supply of stories and different things that we could do and tell. Well, I imagine also that a lot of the collab collaborators you, you hired for Haunted West would have. They could almost each have their own camp, maybe not a separated campaign, but since they come with a different facet of what is going on, you, you got a whole different perspective on the same thing which can come to you. Easily, like at least two or three per person almost. What were there a couple of things uh, which surprised you the most that you did not realize when you started Haunted West and then uh, someone from another minority or from, with a specific point of view brought up and you realize, oh, yeah, I didn't realize that. And that's very, that's very cool and interesting to, to integrate to the game. Um, a lot of it came, the few things actually that specifically spring to mind are some things I learned from Daniel Kwan about San Francisco and some of the Chinese immigrants that came in. And it also gave me a chance to read up more about some of the different immigration laws that were put in place that I wasn't aware of. So that helped change and shift a lot of different things. Like you know, some of the initial 49ers for the mining came from China and other places, and they were out also panning for gold. And it got so bad that the government came in and they instituted new laws that taxed anyone that wasn't an American so they couldn't afford to be there to do panning because they wouldn't make enough money to stay and sustain themselves. Little snippets like that of history that get lost. Yeah, there's so much stuff. It's interesting uh, how in uh, in Harlem and Bond you mentioned the also the Harlem Hellfighters, how uh, they were not supported appropriately by the U.S. government or at least advert advertised, and then it was the Harlem community. And you mentioned something, but uh, I didn't go. You, I didn't see any more details about that. That apparently France was supportive of their situation, but yeah, not the U.S. government. Um, and a lot of that didn't change that much. I have, I have also done a little bit of work, smidge, with uh, Arc Dream for Godlike, which deals with World War II. And a lot of what I sort of happened in World War One also occurred again in World War Two. And having been a veteran myself from the military, it's better, but it is not better. Is it? It reminded me the story also of uh, a lot of. I, I've got a. a uh, personal interest in the the events of the Spanish Civil War uh, and uh, the International Brigade and the, the Republican Army and uh, of course you, you had the Abraham Lincoln Brigade uh, which was from the US and went to fight fascism in Spain and uh, not only uh, people from the US but from all over the world Belgium, France, Ireland, the UK uh, I was reading something about uh, Highland. Uh, the, the, actually, one of the best sources uh, about the, the Spanish Civil War came from the United Kingdom and Ireland. But uh, they had this similar situation of they went on to fight uh, what a lot of people would consider the good fight. And after, when things were over, uh, they were seriously short-handed on a personal and collective uh, level. Uh, yes, I know there's a movie called Hope, uh, L'Espoir, by uh, André Malraux about uh, the uh, the International Brigade. Uh, and it, what's fascinating is when I saw that movie, it was a VHS tape, and at the front they still had an announcement by a French captain in London during World War II explaining that the people fighting there, including André Malraux, were already the people fighting in the resistance at the time when he was recording that. So they were using the movie as a propaganda tool during World War II, saying those people were already fighting all fight. They just started earlier than us. And those people, uh, the, it's a Spanish unit which was the first to enter Paris to free it, uh, the, the ninth, the Nueve, but yeah, they got completely erased from history because when World War II ended, 
the assumption was that they would go, so we did Mussolini, we did Hitler, now we're going to do Franco. And they said, no, actually, we're not, we're not, we're good, so we're going to stop here. So, and we're not going to mention that in our history classes, like uh, a lot of other stuff, and uh, you don't have any retirement. Congratulations, thank you very much for helping uh, all of you. Actually, we're going to chase you because it's the Cold War starting and you were affiliated with communist organizations. Uh, although you certainly, most of you, staunch anti-Stalinist, we're going to pursue you uh, all over uh, the world and uh, make your life hell. So, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm, I mean, yeah, uh, I'm privileged in many ways, uh, but the the lack of teaching of history is something which frustrates me, and that's why I, I like the idea of Tibot of Roping him as a way to engage with history and cultivate that curiosity to go and fetch uh, more information about, yeah, World War I was not just fought by Britons with a cup of tea and uh, the French in the blue petrol suit. There, there were a lot of uh, uh, fighters from North Africa and uh, loads of places, places, including Harlem, which were sent there for for reasons which were not not their own. They, they were called the European Wars, not the the World War One uh, at the time. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Is this? Is, I assume, uh, as a veteran, that's something which was dear to you to to include in Harlem and Bond. And is that something you you looking to explore more in supplements the Harlem L fighters? Um, it, it was very important. I actually put a little disclaimer at the start of the Harlem L fighter scenario about it, and it's something that's been included in both editions of the book. I, I have some ideas that I want to do, but I'm not going to give spoilers because there are a bunch of other creatives who are also brilliant that would probably want to write them too. So, sorry, gang. <laughs> well, it's fine, but the two world wars are slightly less World War One, but are still things which, for for good reasons, but uh, I mean, just like addressing racism, I, uh, I assume in, in a role-playing game, uh, people tend not to to want to engage too much with w w World War One and World War Two, and uh, now we got the fall of Delta Green, so we got the Vietnam War. But uh, yeah, what what do you think are the the stories you wish were told regarding what it's like to be uh, in the military? Because it's kind of a trope in role playing games to be a former member of the military, or you're in Star Wars, you're in the middle of the war. But at the same time, it's there's so much about these sort of events which are not mentioned at all because it's all vanilla war. It's uh, shooting lasers and uh, at most you got a burn and you're you're knocked unconscious, but or you're you're dead. But it's it's very clean and uh, sanitized. Uh, that's that's a hard one because it depends on what level of realism you want in your game, and if you really wanted to get into what it's like to be in the military or a soldier, then you're gonna definitely need to have some sort of warning for players and readers in general because it is not an easy thing to do and part of it is just from the training part of the things that you see part of the thing is that you're ordered to do like you can even look now in the news about what soldiers are being ordered to do that goes probably against their own ethics but they're trapped in having to do it and that's not something that's easy to convey to people this it, uh, I was hearing uh, about the, they're just releasing a uh, virtual reality thing uh, aimed at giving a sort of a idea what it was like to be in the trenches in World War One. And one of the things they were explaining the the sound. So it's it's made by uh, Dan Carlin, uh, and stuff which are fascinating is. The sound is made by Skywalker Sound, the, the people who did the, the Star Wars and all of that. And one of the questions they, which came up when they were doing the experience was, okay, how far do we go with the sound? Because just the sound of being in a trench in certain circumstances would physically hurt your ears. So, they, so they, they were like, okay, how far do we go with that experience? Because you cannot... And it's also triggering for people that have been in certain situations. Like I know, for instance, for me, I've actually heard IEDs go off and I've seen their impact before. And that isn't something that I want to see or hear again. 
I thought it was interesting in Harlem and Bond how you you suggested to actually uh, what's the word? There were different levels of realism and use of your discrimination rules within the game. Uh, you, that you could play them, you could play Harlem and Bond to some extent without them, or then you got the level which you recommended, which were soft sort of mild setting and then the, the full setting uh how important was it for you to to have this sort of, of settings to yeah uh, and and wh why do you think it's you, in the end you didn't have just these are the rules and that's it and you, i'm not around if you don't want to apply them but uh that's it no, no choice for you for, for me it was critical because i wanted the game to be accessible and something that people would play it's already a hard topic for a lot of people to deal and engage with. And even from how I wrote it, I get a lot of feedback from mostly white gamers saying that I think this is a great book. It'll be on my shelf, but I will never play this game. Or I don't feel comfortable playing this game. I actually put a new bit in the second edition that directly addresses that. But if I'd only put the rules how I think people should play it, then it would probably not be played probably played 50% as much as it is now. And that wasn't my goal. And I wanted to give people the choice of what layer they wanted to go for their own realism in their game and their group. To give them something they can be comfortable with. That's why I have like three different tiers. The first tier is you sort of do a lot of inferring, but there's no mechanics. There's nothing really negative that happens for your character specifically. It's more you get the sense that this is where something would have happened. And then at the second tier is where you in, where institute the racial modifier table. Because while you may have a social contract with your group, I don't want players to feel targeted by their GM and having an actual physical widget in the system is a metagame level that lets people step away from it and say the GM can only do X, X, and X to my character. I can see it, I understand it, and I can process and deal with it. And so those are just essential key points to have to make it playable for everyone else. Did you get a lot of feedback from uh, people who actually ran it? Uh, white people, uh, black people, and uh, of what their experience was uh, running it? Most of the people that I've gotten feedback from really enjoyed it, and they didn't understand how intense it would be and how difficult it is to actually engage the game that way. They're used to coming to it and playing completely with privilege that is then sort of somewhat stripped away in Harlem and Bound. And stripping away that privilege and having it be a horror game, and some and some of the deadlier horrors are mundane horrors because I made a specific point of saying, don't have your horror, your supernatural horrors, be the facilitators of your mundane horror. That doesn't know that's not how it works. The actual human horrors of themselves and their choices are scarier, if not more scary, than what this mythos entity is over here for our characters. Uh, what was I? Uh, again, uh, I threw you off again. Sorry, what? Did I throw you off again? Uh, no, no, it's not you. Uh, really, uh, I think I'm gonna take a break with this show because uh, I'm I'm sort of uh, at the end of my my own line uh, uh, emotionally uh, lately. Uh, <laughs> um, so. Uh, do you think uh yeah no uh yeah actually i was thinking uh, of my my last interview uh i find it very interesting because there's been this debate a bit online regarding whether or not uh, those sort of ideas at their place uh in role-playing games and what i did not realize at first uh i was on the the side of saying uh these sort of things have their place in role-playing game because i think there are not many mediums as powerful as role-playing games to develop a beginning of an understanding and empathy of somebody else's situation. Uh, and yeah, so it was a great tool to do that. And it's only recently that I realized something which, uh, like many things, uh, should have been obvious to me and, and other people, is that, okay, for me, a privileged person, that's an experience which develops empathy to understand, but for someone who's subject to that in their real life, it's just something which piles on in a, on a difficult situation they're already living through and they have no 
agency to stop. Uh, for for me, if I play a lemon bond, I'm like, wow, that's very intense uh, to be the subject of racism. That was an interesting experience. Well, off I go now to my real life, uh, which uh, in which I, I'm not the subject of that. Uh, yeah, so... But the thing that you're leaving out of that, that's key, is that you may suddenly go, oh, wasn't me, and you scamper off to real life. But when you see this happen to someone else, that tr should trigger something in anyone with empathy to go, crap, I, I have a slimmer of a sliver of an idea of what that is. Maybe I can use my privilege to help this person without privilege or that's being disparaged right now. Well, that's, that's, that's the key, well, that's a crux. That's taking people with privilege to showing them, trying to show them something and then have them use their privilege to help people being disparaged or oppressed. And I've, I've also read the different debates back and forth about whether or not it works or doesn't work. But the thing is, if it's a game that you don't want to play, you don't have to play it, so it's a choice. But at the same time, I've had a lot of other black people come to me and say, thank you for writing this game. Like this puts some of my experience out to the world. Well, we definitely don't have enough of that uh, in all entertainment media. I guess to, to end on the, uh, well, it will depend on your answer, but it's somewhat positive note. Uh, do you think things are, are improving in not only tables of roping it, but in the media? Uh, is there, you know, more than lip service than representation uh, starting to to come? And movies and then productions, pieces of art which are telling that, conveying that story uh, more today uh, than in the past. And if so, which which are there which you would recommend? I would say take a look at the news right now and you can decide for yourself. Uh, anything else to add before it's going to be time for me to... No, no, I mean, we can we can discuss... Uh, I'm going to have to wake up my son. Uh, I'm uh, blinded by, by time. Uh, but uh, yeah, is there anything left you, you wish to, to discuss? I mean, we can discuss the news. Uh, I told you before we, we recorded. Uh, if you want to, to discuss that. I didn't really segue uh, into it because I was... You, you look like place. you're pretty drained right now. So, yeah, no, um, that, that doesn't that, matter. That really thanks doesn't for having matter. me on. That really... uh, thanks for having me on. I hope that people really do engage with the material that I'm trying to make and they take it and they use some of that empathy that hopefully they're learning to help other people. Because if we're not doing that, then we're not doing anything at all and we're all doomed to fail. Well, on that, uh, well, Chris, where can people find you uh, if you wish to be found? Uh, I guess if people want to follow my my brutal, obviously depressing uh, new Twitter feed, I'm at Dark Review Studios. So at Dark Review on Twitter. And uh, I will include a link in the description of the episode so people can go fetch that out. Uh, if you're watching this before... Uh, this weekend, which is uh, June 19th, 20th, and 21st, uh, we'll be running demonstrations of my own game, uh, which is uh, Paris Gondo, the life saving magic of inventorying. Uh, it's free, and I will just encourage people to, to donate to different charities for Black Lives Matter. Uh, so uh, that's it. Uh, and yes, the National uh, Bailout Fund. Yes. Uh, We're actively helping people on the street right now, protesting, trying to make our world better and by doing that you're potentially letting someone go home to their family that night that they had to leave to go and try to fight our fight for us yeah because every day the, the news get uh worse and uh yeah the the scale is f falling from our eyes but uh yeah uh we need to to be proactive as much uh, as we can with that uh well thanks again chris uh, it's a huge honor to have you uh, on the show uh, i will uh, i cannot wait to dive deeper into our element bound and uh, to run it or, or have an opportunity to to play it in the future uh feel free to co to let me know if you have anything else you you want to plug in uh, in the future or in one month two months uh, a year or two uh, you are, i will be uh, honored to have you again and uh Thank on you. On that, uh, that was Cafe Release. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll watch and listen. Take care, everybody. See you around.